All right, welcome back to Advent of Code for what, day eight now? Before we get started, some of you have been asking for a community leaderboard for the YouTube channel, and I have created a community leaderboard for the YouTube channel. If you are participating in Advent of Code and you would like to show up on that leaderboard, here's the code. <laughs> All right, and I wasn't paying attention because I get distracted, but the problem is now available. So let's click in and check it out. The expedition comes across a peculiar patch of tall trees, all planted carefully in a grid. Previous expedition planted them. Determine whether there is enough tree cover here to keep a tree house hidden. To do this, you need to count the number of trees that are visible from outside the grid when looking directly along a row or column. The elves have already launched a quadcopter to generate a map with the height of each tree. So here's our puzzle input, grid of numbers. Each tree is represented as a single digit whose value is at its height, where zero is the shortest and nine is the tallest. A tree is visible if all of the other trees between it and the edge of the grid are shorter than it. Only consider trees in the same row or column. That is, only look up, down, left, or right from any given tree. All of the trees around the edge of the grid are visible since they're already on the edge. So zero is not a zero height tree, but rather a zero height tree that is visible. In this example, that only leaves the interior nine trees to consider. So five, five, one, five, three, 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 five, four. And that tells us what makes a tree visible. With 16 trees visible on the edge and another five visible in the interior, a total of 21 trees are visible in the arrangement. How many trees are visible from outside the grid? So we could do this as a vec of vex that would make iterating over the x direction and the y direction, or no, the positive x and the, pos and the negative x direction. So left and right, very easy. It would be a little bit more difficult to do positive y and negative y, but we could do those via indices too. So I think we don't get away from having to do an iteration over everything. I'm sure there's some small optimizations we could make here, but we basically have to iterate along the vec and keep some state. So for the first one, we have a tree of three, zero, three, and then seven is visible from that side. Going the other way, oh no, we can't do that one actually. They're all visible because they're all in the top row. Two, five is visible, five would not be visible, and then nothing else would be visible in that row and then two and five would be visible. So we could easily parse this into something that is mutable as well, if we wanted to, or we could keep a separate grid. So we could have two grids. The other way that we could do this is probably using a matrix. I think that might be overkill for today. All right, so we're not winning any speed awards today. I just took a second to set up the scaffolding for today's problem. So now we have our input. This needs to parse into a vec of vex if we're gonna do it that way. So instead of doing anything with splitting or whatever, or manually parsing, I'm doing just a separated list by new lines and then a many one for U8s, which should give us a vec of vec of U8s. We'll call these trees and I'll debug out trees just to see what it looks like. And I think I forgot to get rid of the intersperse at the top for the nightly stuff. So I'll just run perco watch x test now. It should give us one failing test and one ignored test. It looks like we're getting bytes. So to alleviate any confusion. Ooh, right, but I did make a mistake here. So in this case, it was parsing U8s and U8 was failing because the numbers are bigger than a U8, but they're not bigger than a U16. So the U16 succeeded, but that's not actually what we want. So I know we can get a car. We could do many car and then we could parse after. We could also take one. So instead of doing an individual digit, we can do something like digit one, which will match all of the digits for the rest of the line as a string slice. We can map over that. Remember, this is on the parser that we're mapping. So we map on this parser and we get a string slice from nums. We do nums.cars, we map over that, we convert it to a digit because we'll have characters at that point and two digit is a function on characters. We have to pass in the radix which is 10 for us because base 10, and then we collect that. So we end up with 30373, 25512, 30373, 25512, 65332, and so on. So our input is correctly parsed into a vec of vex, and we shouldn't call this commands. We should call this uh, parse trees or something. So there are many ways to use nom in combination with more classic or more naive parsing techniques. So for example, for this, we might have done like a split on new lines and then inside of that iterator, we would have had to call cars and then map over it just like we're doing here. But we could also replace this with a custom parser if we wanted to that matched 
one character and then parsed it to a digit and then matched another character and parsed it to a digit and so on. So maybe we'll come back and show that. I just wanted to show that we could also merge the nom world and sort of the other ways that you may be comfortable with doing things. So I think with trees, we probably also want a second set. So we'll make like visible trees equals trees dot iter dot map. And we get a number here, but we're not going to throw the number away. And of course I should have done this. We can destructure this with the input and the trees coming back from parse. And of course this is tree line. So tree line dot iter dot map. And this is the one that we don't care about, which is false and we can collect it. And because we labeled visible trees with a type on line 27 here for Vecca Vecca pools, all of these collects know what to do because it can be inferred from this type signature. So we should end up with a trees and a visible trees. And this should basically be the same stuff all lined up, but all false. So we can modify this a little bit to start off. If we enumerate, then we get the index and some value. Of course, we haven't defined max length yet, but we're mapping over this now with the index, which actually we need the index up here. I put the enumerate in the wrong spot. The enumerate was in the wrong spot because specifically we need the index of the array that we're in. So the if the array itself is at zero or max length, then we want to turn true. And actually I'm going to keep enumerate on the tree line too. So this is going to be line underscore I. So if we're at zero for the arrays, that means we're in the first array. That means we're on the outside which means that it's visible. If we are on the end, which is max length, we're also visible. So max length is there. If this is equal to either of those, our tests are still failing because we haven't returned the right stuff yet. I do need to debug visible trees here. And we could do this later too. So you see that the first one up here is all true. The last one is not because what we need is the length minus one. And then we get the first one and the last one are all visible. Or if line i is zero, then it's also visible. Or if line i is equal to line max length, it's visible. So line max length can be tree line dot length minus one. And that should give us all of this nice output. So true, 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 false, 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 true. That's right. So it's all of the externals. And now we need to iterate. So if we trees dot iter, actually, I don't think we'll trees dot iter. We'll do indexes. U size is not an iterator because it's not. We need to go from zero dot dot to the length because we need ranges. So we end up at 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, et cetera. So we have all the indexes for the direction that we want to go in. So we get the current tree size outside of X. If I is zero, then current tree size equals X. Otherwise, if trees Y X is greater than current tree size, current tree size equals trees Y X and visible trees y x equals true. And what we are running into here is expected u size found u32 for trees y x. Y and x are u sizes, so we should be good on the indexes. Oh, there we go, as u size should be fine. Current tree size as u32. So we'll just do a little bit of conversion back and forth. And this is not i equals zero, this is x equals zero. Cannot borrow visible trees as mutable because we didn't declare it as mutable. Cannot assign twice to mutable immutable variable because we didn't declare current tree size as mutable. Current tree size used here, but it isn't initialized because it could potentially not be. I guess technically it never will be because of our logic, so I'll set this to zero. But that is one of the failures of doing it with the for loops and the indexes. We kind of have to initialize this value first. Okay, so with that, we should be able to debug visible trees and see changes. So all true for the first row, true, true, false, false, true. I think that's right. True, true, false, false, true. Then we have to do this the other way too. So we'll get the other way. True, true, false, false, true for what? Zero, one, two. Interesting. I think that's wrong. True, true. Because if zero is six, then five is inaccurate. Am I doing greater than or equal to? It feels like I am. Current tree size is zero. So four X in zero dot dot trees dot length. If X is zero, the current tree size is X. So that becomes six. And then we loop again. And then we hit else if trees Y X, which should be five is greater than six. Should be five is greater than six. Let's find out. We can put debug really anywhere, <laughs> which is kind of awesome. So if debug macro 
with the expression inside of it, the value that gets returned from this expression will get shown to us. So you see all of these with the expression here. Uh, but we also need y and x. And I bet you those are what use after moves. Or maybe they're not. Maybe I was wrong. What are they? Expected bool found tuple. Ah, right. Because I stuck this in the middle here. And it's not really what I wanted to do. So let's do print line, yada, yada, y, x. So we get this incoming in the loop. 44? Am I adding this? Did I add this to the current tree size equals x? Oh, right. <laughs> They're individual digits right next to each other. I should put a comma in here so I don't confuse myself. So we should be looking at 0, 1, 2, 2, 0, and 2, 1. Right? 2, 0, and 2, 1. 2, 1 is true. Am I doing comparison on the indexes? I am doing comparison on the indexes. Oops. <laughs> It's got to be trees y, x that we're setting here. And this has got to be what as u size again. Okay, that is probably what the issue was. So true is for the first, true, true, false, false, true, 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 false, false, true, and then true, false, 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 true. Yes, that is correct now. Okay, I'm pretty confident that we have the true, false, true, false, true, true, false, true, false, true. Yes. Okay, so I think we're good. Um, it's a little annoying to keep writing this little thing over and over again. I refactored day seven so I can refactor today too. So this is gonna be y and x from zeros from the left. So we need to reverse this. And then if x is trees.length minus one, right? And that should do both of them. Of course, our debugs are sitting everywhere still. <laughs> um, let's take a look at each of these. And let's say we're looking at this from the right-hand side. So the third one down. So this from the right hand side should be true, true, false, and it's not. So is this even running is my question. Let's get rid of the debugs in the stuff that works. Oh, we do get it, actually. Um, I think I was just looking at the wrong thing. I was quite literally just looking at some old output. <laughs> okay, so let's check to see if it works from this side. First one is all true. Then we get true, false, true, true, false, true, and then the other one's coming from the left, and then we get true, true, false, so that's correct, and then true, false, but the five is visible from the left, and then all trues. So this all works. This works for x left, x from the left, and x from the right. So now we need to do up and down, <laughs> which is going to be the same logic, but we need to do if y is equal to zero, and we need to reverse each of these um, accesses. So let's copy this and I'll leave a comment here saying iterations for y's, iterations for x's. And we paste this in and I think the iterations are fine because we need all of these values. Actually, the iterations are not fine because we need to iterate over x here and then everything that's a y becomes an x and everything that's an x becomes a y. So let's do but those accesses still need to happen like that. So I think these three are the only ones we need to change. So this is an X, this is a Y, we'll get rid of the print line, and then this is a Y. Okay, so the question is, is that the correct answer? 21 trees are visible. So this needs to be visible trees dot iter. I guess we could flat map. Let's do dot, we don't really want flat map because we don't really need this to be anything else. We can flatten, flatten, dot filter, dot count, dot two string. So because those are Booleans, I think that we're good just dereferencing this. Oh, that's not what we need. Filter, oh, it's a double. So we can just do this. We can destructure these shared references. It's a double shared reference because iter is one shared reference. So we got visible trees, we're iterating over that. Uh, then we're filtering, filtering adds another shared reference. So we get a double shared reference here because we're just doing a comparison. So we need a reference to whatever we have to do the comparison. And then we can count whatever's left. And I didn't add the number to the test, so the test will never pass, uh, but it's passing now. So it looks good. Let's get rid of these different debugs and stuff because they are contaminating the output. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. So let's get the actual input. Let's hope that we did all of the things that we needed to do that were variable. Chuck this into our input, do a cargo run bin part one get 1,807, hope that we got the right answer, <laughs> and we did, we got a gold star. 
So we did it pretty manually. We did very manual iteration. We didn't use any fancy data structures. We didn't use any fancy accessing. We did indexes for all the trees. We used two different VEC of VEX, one to read from and one to write to. So overall, this is not a particularly sophisticated answer, but that's okay. Not all Rust needs to be sophisticated. So our process part was one. Bleh. So our process part one parses the trees. We do a separated list of new lines. We get the digit for each new line or each section. So we do digit one, which will grab us all of the numbers as a string slice. We can map over that. Remember this map is on this parser, which will give us the result of that parser, the successful result that is of that parser. If we wanted to deal with the error, we could do like a map error or something like that. We take that string slice, we turn it into characters and we go character two digit. We unwrap that because it should always succeed and then we collect it. That by nature turns it into a U32 because 32 bits is the default for a lot of the number types. And then we return that. So what we end up with is a VEC of VEC of U32s. So the tree heights, and then we want to create a visible trees. Visible trees is going to be a VEC of VEC of Booleans that is directly based off of the trees. So we do a little bit of a sneaky thing here. We just set the entire outer rim to be true which is why we calculate the max length of trees and also the max length of each line. Uh, I did these separately because I wasn't sure if this set of trees was going to be a square or a rectangle. And if it's a square, then we only need to calculate max length once on the outside. But if it's a rectangle and those X and Y dimensions are different, the width and the height are different, then we need to calculate it both ways here. So trees.iter enumerate, we get the index, we get another max length so we know how long these lines can be. And then we iterate over the tree line itself with the enumerate. We test to see if any of those are in either the zero index. So they're either the first element or they are the last element. If they are either the first or the last, they're on the outside border. So we set those to true. Otherwise we set those to false and we have our initialized vec of vec of bool for whether a tree is visible or not. Then we manually iterate over these in four different ways. Realistically, these are two ranges. So from zero to whatever the length of the line is, for y and zero for whatever the length of the line is for x. So we will hit every position and we will do so in an order. So we're going left to right for this first iteration, right to left for the second, then up to down for the third and down to up for the fourth. So for that, we just guarantee that if our index is zero, which we've already set to true, so we don't even need to worry about. So you can see how that setting the first index to true can either happen right here in this if, or it could happen up there when we're setting everything up. So if uh, we're in the first index, all we do is set the current tree size. So how tall the tree that we just saw was to whatever value is there from trees. We do this as u size because we're iterating over indexes. So we get u sizes for those. And I didn't feel like changing it. So we used u size. It's not a big deal for us. We don't have numbers that are that big. A u8 would have worked for us for these numbers. <laughs> so for each of them, we compare it to the last tree we saw. If the last tree we saw is bigger, then it's false. If it's not bigger, then we set it to true. And we do that four times in each direction. Then we have visible trees, which is our finalized output. We either have a true or a false in every position that we've seen. So we iterate over that. We flatten the VEC of VEX into a single VEC. We filter all of the Boolean values. We can just pass the Boolean value back in because we set true to visible and false to not visible. And then we count what's left. We two string that and we get 21 or whatever the answer is for the other one. So part two, content with the amount of tree cover available, the elves just need to know the best spot to build the tree house. They would like to be able to see a lot of trees. To measure the viewing distance from a given tree, look up, down, left, and right from that tree. Stop if you reach an edge or at the first tree that is the same height or taller than the tree under consideration. If a tree is right on the edge, at least one of its viewing distances will be zero. The elves don't care about distant trees taller than those found by the rules above. The proposed treehouse has large eaves to keep it dry, so they wouldn't be able to see higher than the treehouse anyway. So there's some restriction here that should make it easier for us. In the example above, consider the middle five in the second row. That's this number right here. Looking up, the view is not blocked. It can see one tree. Looking left, its view is blocked immediately. It can only see one tree of height five next to it. Looking right, its view is not blocked. It can see two trees. Looking down, its view is blocked eventually. It can see two trees. So three and five and then we can't see three. A tree's scenic score is found by multiplying together its viewing distance in each of the four directions. 
For this tree, this is four. Found my multiplying one, one, two, two. However, you can do even better. Consider the tree of height five in the middle of the fourth row. Then we do the calculations again, and the scenic score is two, two, one, one, presumably because five can see three and five, three, four and nine, and three and three. Consider each tree on your map, what is the highest scenic score possible for any tree? So we can do the same thing we just did, um, and it'll just be a little, a little unfortunate, I guess. So if we take process part two and we copy and paste the section of this that is setting up the visible trees, we can get rid of this visible trees setup actually, because it doesn't matter for us, I don't think. Actually, what would be the best way to do this? We have a set of trees that we need to iterate over. We need to iterate over every single individual tree. We need to do so reading out of trees and we need to do some indexing to go in each of the four directions, then we can set that value after we calculate it into the positions in another VEC of X. We don't have to keep all four values around because we can just straight multiply them immediately. So we only need to keep one number around. So I think what we want is actually the scenic scores here, and this will be a U32. And all we need to do here is not do any of these enumerate things because we don't care. We don't need enumerate. We actually don't need anything in this map. Everything is just set to zero. So we're just setting up a scenic scores that is the size of the trees. So we have the trees that we have in a VEC of VEC, and then we have each of the scores initialized to zero in the other scenic scores. So if we do trees.iter.enumerate for y tree height in that, right? No, not tree height. Y index, I think we just need Y index here, right? And then this is the tree line. And then for X index tree height in tree line dot iter dot enumerate, I'll stick a to do here to make it look like we finished the function. And then what we get is the ability to iterate over every tree. So if I print line here and I do something like X, Y, and we can use the variable names that we defined. So X index, Y index, tree height. So we don't even need to pass anything in. We can just run this. And what is the answer for test number two? Test number two is, it doesn't tell us the answer. Oh, this is the ideal spot. So number eight. And it wants the score. Yeah, the highest score possible for any tree. Actually, so we don't even need the scenic score thing that we set up. If we just need the highest score possible, so the highest score is zero. <laughs> and then we'll just update it if we get a higher one. And then we can't ignore the test, of course. So if we watch with test, then we get x, y, three, zero, three, seven, three, zero, seven, three, two, five, five, one, two. So we get all, all of them. Okay. So we've got the x and the y index for every tree and the tree height that it has. So we now need to calculate how far it can see. So all we need to do is take each of the values and either increase it or decrement it until it gets to the max. So we let y max equals trees.length, which is the number of arrays that we have. And then we need let x max equal trees zero dot length. We know we'll have at least one tree length. So this should not be an issue for us. So we need to do for, let's say zero dot dot x. So for x position in zero dot dot x, we need to debug all the trees to the left. So we should get trees y x position is it y index y index and this is x index and i should spell out my words so does this work is the question so for zero zero there's nothing to the left of it so we get nothing it doesn't even iterate so what happens if it doesn't iterate is that a score of zero or is a score of one if a tree is right on the edge at least one of its viewing distances will be zero but because of the math that we need to do later do we count that as zero or do we count that as one for the multiplication? I'm going to start with the assumption that if there is a tree on the edge, then it will have a scenic value of zero. So if we do the multiplication, then we end up with a scenic score of zero because it has to at least be inside of the tree line. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I'm going to start with. So for each tree, we set up scores as zero, 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 zero. It doesn't really matter which is which, but we'll start with, we need to reverse this actually. So we need to go out from the center. So new tree height equals tree height, which is the 
treehouse height that would be at. So if we were at five, the treehouse would be on five, which means that if there is another five, like in the first example here to the left, looking left, his view is blocked immediately. So the tree that blocks the view is visible. So we have to do less than. So if the tree that we are given is less than the new tree height, we don't need to update this tree height ever, do we? If it gets blocked, it's done. So tree height this is going to be tree height. Let's say this is tree house height, which is also the tree height. Uh, expected U32 found a reference to a U32. So we can compare to the dereferenced version of the number. So if the tree we're given is less than the tree house height, then scores zero plus equals one. And we of course have to set scores to mutable so that we can do that score zero plus equals one. Otherwise scores zero plus equals one, and then we break. So if we debug scores, do we get the right scores going out from the left for any of these? So let's start with four, zero. So zero, one, two, three, four. So four, zero should be one because it's only the seven. That's true. Choose another random one, something like what's interesting. Five. I think this five here is interesting. So zero, one, two, three, and zero, one, two. So three, two, or two, three from the way that we are presenting it on the page. Where's two, three? Two, three is a five and it's a score of two. That looks right. And then we can look for four, three for an interesting case as well. Four, three is a nine. Nine can view everything. So we're good. So this is what we need to do for everything. So let's leave a comment here that says, to left, to right. How do we go to right? We do not zero dot dot and not reverse. So we need to do x index plus one dot dot. What is the max length? We calculated the max length already, right? X max. And this is gonna be scores one. So we could put that in a struct. Struct would probably be safer bet. We are getting some values in here. So let's check to see if we did our math correctly. Do we have a case where what is my concern here? We're gonna be X index. So if we're at four, four, then we do five up until, no, four, four is not a good one. Zero, four, maybe. Yeah, zero, four. So we do one, two, three. So zero, four is this three, right? Zero, four is this three. So we need to go five, three, nine, zero, but it cuts off at nine. Actually, it cuts off at five. So it's immediately done. The thing that I wanna test is to see if we can get to the end of the line the max, which six should be able to do. So zero, three should be our test case for that. Zero, three, no, zero, two. Zero, two should be our test case for that. Zero, two, then we get five, three, three, two. So it should see over all of them. This should be a score of four. It is a score of four. So I think we're good. So this is to the right. And then we need to do the same thing, but these are gonna be reversed, two up, two down. So this is for Y position in zero dot dot y index. And this is gonna be y position with x index. So the current tree is index. And this is gonna be the third score. And that looks okay. So this is gonna be the y position in the y index to the y max. And it's gonna be y position and the x index. The x index is the poorly named value. Anything with index is the current tree. Anything with position is the position offset. So this will be four, I think, if I'm counting correctly. No, zero, one, this should be two, and then this should be three. That's what that should be. And then index out of bounds because I typed four after deleting four. That's silly. Okay, so we have what I think is all of the values. And I'm gonna assume that because we checked the left and right that the logic for up and down is also correct. So we have scores here, right? That's all of these scores. We need to do scores dot iter dot product, which if you watched the rustlings video that I put out, you will know that product will multiply all four values together for us. So we don't have to do that manually, which is really nice. So we have these scores, these four values, dot product will take each item in the iterator and multiply it against the next one. So let's let tree score or scenic score, I guess is the name of this, right? Scenic score equals this. And then if scenic score is greater than high score, I think we called it high score, then high <laughs> score equals scenic score. And then the to do down here is high score to string. And the test passed, so I think we're good. So if we've cargo run bin part two, 
and we get rid of all these print lines. Let's get rid of uh, this specifically. 48, 480,000. 480,000 seems like a big number. How big is our input? Is that even reasonable? I guess it is, right? Because what? This could be like reasonably, what, 20 times 20 times 20 times 20? It would have to be more than that, so I miscounted. But you could theoretically see a whole bunch. So let's, I'm going to go to some random, a random site. I'm going to paste in one of the lines, and it's 99. So we do up to something like 45 times 45, which seems like plenty. So I'm going to say that this is a plausible answer and submit it. And it's the right answer, actually, which is great. I always get nervous when they're even numbers, you know, like 480,000 doesn't feel like an advent of code answer. <laughs> so we did this kind of messily. Uh, we did this with a bunch of for loops again. Again, not all Rust needs to be sophisticated. We don't always need to use the perfect data structures. We don't always need to use references everywhere. Parse trees gives us our vec of vec of U32s, which is all the tree heights. We set up a mutable high score variable to track the scenic score for the most scenic tree. Y max is the number of arrays that we have. X max is the number of columns that we have. We are cheating a little bit here because we always know that tree zero will exist. So for Y index tree line in trees.iter.enumerate, so this gives us the Y index, so which uh, row we're in. And then for X index tree house height is the tree line.iter.enumerate, which gives us the X index that we're in along with the height that we, along with the height of the tree that we're looking at. So that's where we're going to build the treehouse. Then we get scores, which is, this could be and probably should be a struct in its own right. So so we could do something like this to keep track of it a little bit nicer. Um, I chose to not do that. I chose to take the easy way out and do an array here. All that means is that when we write our code, it's a little bit less legible. So we get score zero instead of left. So for each of the trees that we're in, we have the current position that we're in, and we construct a range from either zero to the tree exclusively, so zero to the spot before the tree, or from the spot to the right of the tree to the end, and similarly for vertical, so either from zero to the spot before the tree or from the spot after the tree to the max value. Each of those gives us the set of trees moving out from our tree. So we get the direction correct by reversing the zero, so we can't do like negative ranges here. So we do a range from zero to whatever, and then we reverse it. We just look at the tree. If it's lower than we are, we add one. If it's not lower than we are, then it's our last one. We still add one, but we break out of the for loop and we move on to the next one. We do that four times for each direction. We put those in different score spots. We can calculate the scenic score by doing scores, which is the array of numbers, dot iter, dot product. We set the value or the type that we're collecting into to be a U32. If we wanted to, we could also put the U32 over here on the left, if you like that more. If the scenic score for the tree that we're currently processing is greater than the highest score we've seen, then we set the highest score to the scenic score. And if we iterate over all the trees, then we get all the scores, and then we can turn the high score into a string. And that's it. That is part two. And we get this nice ASCII art and stuff that we're getting here with the little stream inlet thing. There are a couple changes we could make for example, there's even a change without changing really much else. Instead of bootstrapping the outer edges to be like true by default, we could get rid of that. And then we already have that value in this if statement or if expression for every single iteration that we do. So we could just set the true here instead, but we would have to do it four times. And then of course, what other options do we have for iteration? We could do windows, right? If we do windows, then we get the current tree and the next tree, and we can compare them directly rather than doing all this indexing. If we do it that way, we still have to dot enumerate on those. Um, but maybe I'll show that in a refactor video tomorrow. I think that I tend to not do mutation and not do for loops enough that it's worth showing because most of the other videos end up with a very functional approach. So maybe, maybe I'll refactor this to use windows or something like that. That could be cool but we would still be iterating over it anyway. So we really just get rid of some of the indexing. The parser logic is new. We showed, we showed how you can kind of combine something that is maybe more of a manual parsing mechanic. So num.cars.map and combine that with a nom parser. So a separated list new line, instead of doing a split on the new line and then doing another iterator inside of it, 
It allows us to have a little bit more control over what's going on. And we can always change this parser right here into something else. So we could have a parser that is a number that takes a character and then tries to parse a number out of that character. So if we wanted to write a parser that actually did do a number here, we could write a num that takes an input of string that takes an i result. Even before doing any custom error handling, we could do any character on the input to take one character off. And then we could take that and turn it into a digit. Because we know this is always going to succeed, we can unwrap it and return the number. And then we get a parser that is the numbers. Once we have that, we can get rid of this whole new or this whole digit one here and do many one uh, num, and it works just the same. So if we want to abstract that parser, we can. We could also do something like verify. So verify is a combinator that takes a parser and then lets you apply a verification to it. So we can, for example, guarantee that if this parser succeeds in this a num, we take any car, we verify that c dot two digit ten is sum. If that succeeds. Then we get back the character here and we can know that when we run two digit here that we can unwrap this safely so in this way we can build up more sophisticated error handling from our parsers even though doing the parsing in this example in this exercise for advent of code wasn't particularly complicated so i hope you enjoyed that of course we'll be back again tomorrow for the next problem for i think what is it day eight no day nine day nine is tomorrow <laughs> so have a great rest of your day and I'll see you tomorrow.